Thank you. It's such an honor and a privilege to be asked to speak with you today. And I just first want to express my gratitude for being selected to undergo this training, which has been tremendously informative. I've really enjoyed talking with people here today and hearing other people's presentations. So thank you. Today we're going to talk about prognosis. And when I say prognosis, I mean it's a forecast. It's a forecast of the likely outcome of a condition or a treatment. But when most people hear prognosis, they think about life expectancy or how long have I got to live, doc? And that's what we're going to focus on today. By way of getting started, I want to acknowledge and thank three people in particular. This is the first. This is my father, Blake Wales Hendy Smith. My father taught at a medical school in Michigan where I grew up. And he was at an academic meeting one day when he experienced a seizure and slid under the table. He was taken to the emergency department. And the evaluation there included a scan of his head that showed that he had a large tumor in his brain. The subsequent workup showed that that tumor was a glioblastoma multiforme, which is an invariably fatal cancer with a prognosis of about one year. Now, I just completed my first year of medical school at the UC Berkeley UCSF joint medical program at the time. Uh, my father underwent surgery to remove the bulk of the tumor, and then he had a follow-up appointment with his neurosurgeon. I flew back from California to Michigan to be with him at that follow-up appointment. I remember that neurosurgeon walking into the room and saying to my dad, I got it all, Blake. I got it all. Now I knew that that neurosurgeon could take out a lot of that cancer. He could reduce the number of cells from 10 to the 11th to 10 to the 9th. But he couldn't get it all. And I worried that even though my dad was very educated, he worked at a medical school, and he knew the prognosis of his condition, that that statement, that statement about prognosis played into every hope against hope that my father had. I was so angry at that neurosurgeon. And I've used that anger at that statement, that lie, to try and improve the way that we communicate with patients about progress. I also want to say that my dad died ago, and this is the first time I've been able to talk about illness and his death in public, which I think also says something about grief and bereavement. This is a picture of me with a patient um, in residency. I attended a small primary care residency uh, um, at the Brigham in Boston. And um, a bunch of us in the primary care residency had just read this seminal article by Louise Walter, who's now, coincidentally, my division chief. And the article was on individualizing cancer screening decisions in the elderly. And the idea was that we shouldn't be screening patients based on these arbitrary age-based cutoffs but rather we should be individualizing these decisions based on their likelihood to benefit from a screening test that's designed to detect slow-growing cancers. So I walked into the room with this patient and I said, congratulations, we don't have to take mammograms, do mammograms anymore. You're done! <laughs> and I could feel the temperature in the room drop. And she said, well, why, doctor? Um, I've been getting mammograms for a long time. Why should we stop now? And I said, well, you're unlikely to survive long enough to benefit. <laughs> and the temperature in the room dropped further. <laughs> and that's when I realized, you know, these conversations are really hard. They take skill just like any other aspect of medicine, like any procedure that we do. And they take training. 
So I went on from that primary care residency to complete a fellowship in palliative care so I could learn those communication skills. And then I did a two-year fellowship in general internal medicine so I could gain the research skills to improve the science about prognosis communication. And the third person I want to thank is somebody who's probably done more to push the national conversation about the critically important role of prognosis in medical decision making. And that's Sarah Palin. <laughs> so I came back to UCSF on faculty in 2008, and if you remember late 2008, early 2009, there was all, tremendous excitement in Washington, D.C. about health care reform. And they were drafting this new legislation. And in the legislation, there was a measure that would reimburse physicians for having conversations with patients about important things like prognosis, plans and preferences for care at the end of life, what their goals and values would be, really sensible things. And Sarah Palin wrote on her Facebook page <laughs> that she did not want death panels of insurance agents making life or death decisions about her family members. And in the furor that resulted over these so-called fictitious death panels, all legislation related to palliative care, to prognosis, to communication about uh, plans and preferences for end of life was stripped from the Affordable Care Act. Palliative care, end of life care became toxic on Capitol Hill. But rather than bury the issue as Sarah Palin that in intended, she raised it to a level of public consciousness. That we realize that it's not enough to take the importance of these conversations at face value. We need to work at honing and articulating our message for the public so that they understand the critical importance of these conversations in everyday care. I'd like to introduce you to uh, the ePrognosis team. Um, I've depicted us riding bicycles in a pace line. I'm doing this because in cycling, there are sort of two approaches. One is, individual cyclists out there on their own, battling against the wind. But if you work together in a pace line, one person after the other, then the person in front is conquering all that wind resistance, allowing the people in the back to rest. And then the person in the front peels off to the back, and the next person takes a turn at the front of the line. And that's what we've done in ePrognosis. We've each taken turns at the front of the line. Uh, so behind me is Say Lee, and behind Say Lee is Eric Widera, and the three of us are all in the Division of Geriatrics here at UCSF. Behind Eric Widera is Mara Schoenberg, who's at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School. And behind Mara is Lindsay Yorman. And the e-prognosis story really starts with Lindsay Yorman. Lindsay was a third-year medical student at UCSF around 2009, 2010, and she decided to take a year off from medicine to conduct research with me. Now, I knew that Lindsay had a strong interest in prognosis, and so I had her talk with other members of the division, and what she discovered was that there were many members of our division that had created prognostic indices, or calculators, that help clinicians estimate the prognosis for their patients. But the problem was she'd never heard of them, and most clinicians had never heard of them because they're buried in the academic literature. So we worked together with Lindsay to conduct a systematic review of prognostic indices. We reviewed thousands of titles and hundreds of abstracts, and we identified 16 validated, non-disease-specific prognostic indices for older adult patients. And we published that systematic review in JAMA. And we said to Lindsay, Lindsay, congratulations. You, a medical student, are a first author, publisher in JAMA. You should be so happy. 
But Lindsay was one of these annoying medical students who was very skeptical of the whole academic enterprise. And she said, you know, who's going to read this really? What's it actually going to do? I want to change care for patients at the bedside and in the clinic not in some journal article that's going to get buried somewhere and is only really going to help you get promoted or something. And so we took a deep breath and we thought about it. And we realized, you know, Lindsay's right. If you think through the steps that it takes to identify a prognostic index that will actually be helpful for the patient in front of you, it's pretty long and convoluted. You know, first you go to our systematic review, you go to the table, you say, okay, my patient's in clinic, I'll go look at all these, oh, there are a bunch of indices for patients in clinic, let me figure out which one's the best, which one has the best Terex characteristics. Okay, now I'll flip back and I'll go to the references and I'll find that article, okay, now I'll log into PubMed, okay, now I'm on PubMed, and all right, here's the article, I'll click on the link, and oh, it says you must be a member of the Gerontologic Society of America in order to access this article. I'm not a member. Okay, but I have an affiliation with UCSF, so I will VPN in to UCSF, and then I'll download the article, and I'll print it out, and look, in the back of the article, conveniently, there's a table with all of the risk factors, and I'll write in all of the risk factors for my patient, and then, okay, I need to add up this point score. I'll get my calculator, and I'll type it out, and then, okay, finally, here is the risk for my patient. Okay? There must be an easier way, right? So we created this website, ePrognosis, which stands for Estimating Prognosis in the, El in the Elderly. And we ask some really simple questions to help you identify the best index for the patient in front of you. Where is the patient? Are they in the clinic? Are they are they in the hospital? Are they in a nursing home? What time frame best fits the clinical issue at hand? Is it a long range consideration like cancer screening? Is your patient 65 or older? And then it takes you to this page where you input in simple drop down menus all of the information for the risk factors for the best index that fits the patient in front of you. In this case, the Lee Schoenberg index for a community dwelling older adult. You put in all these risk factors, it totals up the points for you in the background, and you hit calculate risk. And then it gives you the calculated risk. So out of 100 patients, like this hypothetical patient that we have entered, over 10 years, 93 will die, and those are shaded, and 10 will survive, and those are not shaded. And we're not certain which of those 93 out of 100 will survive, and which out of those um, 100 will, survive, will die, and that's why there's some uncertainty here as depicted in this figure. So we launched ePrognosis the same day that we published a paper in JAMA, and we were completely blown away by the response. We were overwhelmed and unprepared. We had an article in the New York Times. We were in USA Today. Um, I was gave a talk on Michael Krasny's uh, radio show forum. I was invited to Washington, D.C. to give a talk to National Academy of Sciences. But more important than any of that to us, the most rewarding feedback has been when doctors come up to us and they say, I use e-prognosis. You know, surgeons here at UCSF who routinely use e-prognosis on every elderly patient they see because they want to know what is the risk for this patient aside from the surgical issue. You know, oncologists who come up to us and say, I use e-prognosis for my patients because I have a patient who has a slow-growing cancer. I'm not sure if I should give them these toxic medications. I want to know what their risk is aside from the cancer. We went to Ida Sim, who's here in general medicine, and she said, you know, e-prognosis, great website, but I want to know, should I be screening my older patients for cancer? I just want to know the answer to that rather than going and looking at a general prognosis. So we created an app. There's an app for that now. This is available free in iTunes, and everything we do is available for free. This is ePrognosis, the cancer screening app. And you can select whether you want to screen for colorectal cancer, breast cancer, or both. 
And we give clinicians a recommendation based on the patient's prognosis of whether they should be continue screening this elderly patient for, ca for cancer. Do the harms outweigh the benefits for that patient? Um, we're, we, we wanna, we're not done yet. We, we want to go further. We want to revolutionize the way that clinicians talk to patients about prognosis. So in the last few years, I published a couple of perspectives in the New England Journal of Medicine arguing that clinicians should offer to talk to all very elderly patients about prognosis and, importantly, this uncertainty associated with their prognosis. We argued that there should be at least as much attention paid to developing the art and the science of communication about prognosis as there is to developing pro better prognostic calculators. I want to leave you with a challenge, and that challenge is use e-prognosis once a week for the next month. See how it changes your perspective. See how it changes the conversations you have with your patients. All of this work that we have done has been done with an eye toward the practical realization of the utilization of prognosis in everyday medical care. It's been done with an eye toward correcting the political missteps of the past. And it does seem now that finally Medicare will start reimbursing physicians for having conversations with patients about prognosis, about plans and preferences, about goals and values, about what they would want for themselves if they were nearing the end of life. All of this work has been done with an eye toward improving communication with patients and their family members so that they are making informed medical decisions. All of this work has been done with an eye toward stopping folks from lying to the ones that we love the most. Thank you.